Quirk. Here. Melendez. Jones Sawyer. Lackey. Here. Lopez. Here. Lowe. Santiago. All right, and we have Madam Vice Chair here as well. All right, uh, first some announcements. Um, so uh, we, we have taken um, WESO SB 303 off the, uh, the calendar for, the, for this morning. So if you're here for that, uh, please come back uh, at our next session. Uh, the proposed consent calendar, and we'll do this now, um, SB 165 Monning, uh, SB 175 Huff, SB 307 Pavley, SB 352 Block, SB 453 Pan, and SB 629 Mitchell. Uh, that's the... Um, Consent calendar, could I have a motion? All right. Moved by uh, Assembly Member Santiago, seconded by the Vice Chair. Um, Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Quirk? Aye. Quirk, aye. Melendez? Aye. Melendez, aye. Joan Sawyer? Aye. Joan Sawyer, aye. Lackey? Aye. Lackey, aye. Lopez? Aye. Lopez, aye. Lowe? Santiago? Aye. Santiago, aye. Consent calendar has been adopted. And then we have one other uh, e uh, easy um, uh, part of our business, and that is um, Huff um, SB 420. Um, it's been agreed that we will. Uh, do you have the exact language? that we're sending the bill to interim study. Uh, in particular, this has to do with um, human trafficking. We're gonna have a human trafficking um, hearing in the interim uh, in the fall, and uh, we've all agreed to hold our human trafficking bills to that point. So could I have a motion to that effect? Moved by the, by the vice chair, seconded by Mr. Santiago. All right. If there's no objection, then we'll just hold it for interim study by unanimous consent. All right. Thank you all very much. We'll now go on to the regular order, the regular order of business and Senator Monning, SB 517. And this uh, bill has an I recommendation. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, Senate Bill 517 corrects an oversight of realignment and clarifies that criminal trial courts have discretion in the custody decisions of supervised individuals who are in jail on a parole hold. Criminal justice realignment under AB 109 shifted the responsibility of administering parole revocation hearings to the criminal trial courts. The statutory realignment language, however, did not contain explicit language outlining the court's role in the custody decisions of supervised persons. SB 517 will correct this oversight and remove any ambiguity as to the court's role in the revocation process. I ask that you join me in clarifying the court's role by voting aye on SB 517. Uh, Mr. Chair, with your permission, I have Sharon Riley with the Judicial Council here to testify in support of the measure. Very good, thank good you. Good morning, good morning, Mr. Chair and members. Um, SB 517 is uh, sponsored by the Judicial Council, and as um, the Senator indicated, this is some necessary cleanup to clarify the court's authority with regard to parole holds. The Council believes that by authorizing courts to determine the custody status of all supervised persons, with the exception of those period of serving a period of flash incarceration of up to 10 days, SB 517 will clarify the law and enhance judicial discretion, discretion about court authority to lift parole holds and order the release of supervised persons, particularly in the absence of warrants and the filings of petitions to revoke supervision. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Um, other witnesses in support? 
Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman, members. Khalif Asagai on behalf of the California Public Defenders Association and support. Good morning, Melinda Blake from Californians for Safety and Justice and Support. Thank you. Thank you. All right, then any witnesses in opposition? Okay, there being none, um, questions from the committee? Could I have a motion? motion. Second. All right, moved and seconded. Uh, you may close. Just respectfully ask your I vote. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Madam Sec uh, so it has an aye recommendation. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Quirk? Aye. Quirk, aye. Melendez? Aye. Melendez, aye. Joan Sawyer? Aye. Joan Sawyer, aye. Lackey? Aye. Lackey, aye. Lopez? Aye. Lopez, aye. Lowe? Lowe, aye. Santiago? Santiago, aye. Bill is out. Congratulations. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, members. Thank you for day. bringing you. this uh, bill forward. Um, the uh, Next bill is SB 651, uh, Senator uh, Leva. This is item number 14. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members. I, too, would like to say you're the most on-time committee. I'm impressed. <laughs> And uh, we on the Senate side could probably take a lesson or two. So good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, first, let me tell you that I will be taking the amendment offered by staff, and I thank staff for their help on this bill. SB 651 expands the definition of a victim within the Welfare and Institutions Code so that it includes family members, guardians, and significant others as derivative victims of a crime committed by a minor. The change in the definition would match the language in the penal code. Under the revised division definition, direct and derivative victims are eligible for compensation for out-of-pocket costs that resulted from a crime committed against them by a minor. No victim should ever be in a position to not be eligible for restitution simply because of an inconsistency in the law. Here with me today is Sandy Carter and Dan Felizado with the Los Angeles County District Attorney Jackie Lacey's office in support of the bill and other supporters. Okay, two witnesses, two minutes each, thank you. Mr. Chairman, members, Dan Felizado on behalf of the Los Angeles County District Attorney's office. We are the sponsor of SB 651. 651 just corrects an oversight in existing law. Uh, as the Senator indicated, uh, several years ago, the legislature amended the definition of victim in the penal code. Uh, expanded it to include derivative victims. That definition was then codified in the state constitution. The Welfare and Institutions Code, however, was not amended, which means today, whenever we get new DAs, new defense attorneys, new judges in the juvenile court, we have to explain to them that the definition of victim is broader than what you're going to see in the Welfare and Institutions Code. For years, uh, this has been uh, widely accepted. It's been codified by many cases. Uh, we just think that it's time that the welfare and institution be updated so that all the definitions are consistent. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Santelia Carter, and I am a senior paralegal on behalf of the District Attorney's Office of Los Angeles County. I believe that SB 651 is important in addition to avoiding having to train court staff and attorneys, it also uh, prevents victims to having to be further victimized by having to wait a prolonged, prolonged period of receiving a restitution by having the definition of a victim uh, translated through the Constitution as opposed to being within the Welfare and Institution Code. Thank you for your time. Uh, other witnesses, uh, name, organization, and position. Good morning, Christine Ward, Crime Victims Action Alliance. We are a co-sponsor of this bill, and we are in strong support. Marty Veronica, on behalf of the California District Attorneys Association, we're in support of this measure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, other witnesses in support? Any witnesses in opposition? There being none, uh, questions from the committee? All right. Um, I have a feeling that we've got uh, support on both sides here. Ah, we have a question from Madam Vice Chair. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, you came all this way and you were on time, so I feel I need to say <laughs> something to you. Um, well, I'm, I'm pleased to see that uh, opposition did not attend this morning. Um, I had a few questions for them, but since they're not here, I just want to say um, thank you for bringing this bill forward. I think what you are highlighting is the fact that um, victims are as important, if not more important, than those who commit the crimes. And we can't dis you know, distinguish between the two and favor one over the other. Um, I would argue most people would agree with that. Um, so I very much appreciate, as do the victims who this bill is going to affect, that you brought this bill forward. Thank right. you, Assembly Member. And uh, I will second the uh, comments of my vice chair, as well as saying this is, it's very clear. Occasionally, uh, a judge rules the wrong way on this, gets appealed, and then you end up with this same ruling. So this is definitely a good government measure. Uh, it has an I recommendation. Um, you may close, Senator DeLeva. Just respectfully ask for an I vote. All right. Um, Madam Secretary, please call the roll. The motion is due pass as amended. Quirk? Aye. Quirk? Aye. Melendez? Aye. Melendez? Aye. Joan Sawyer? Aye. Joan Sawyer? Aye. Lackey? Aye. Lackey? Aye. Lopez? Aye. Lopez? Aye. Lowe? Lowe? Aye. Santiago? Aye. Santiago? Aye. Bill is out. Congratulations. Thank you very much. All right. Oh, I have a perfect record so far. <laughs> All right. Senator Block. Well, I hope we keep the perfect record. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, SB uh, 456, item number 11. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, SB 456, first of all, um, is a bill that addresses oral, written, or electronically delivered threats of gun violence occurring on school property and at locations where school functions are taking place. I want to thank uh, committee staff for their suggested amendments, and we will accept those amendments. Um, Threats of gun violence are costly to our schools. Even when no violence takes place, you have school officials who are taken off their normal task. You have students who are taken away from the classroom, taken away from learning. You often have whole communities and businesses that are shut down around a school where there's threats of, of school shooting, not to mention the anxiety for students and staff and parents. The cost of these threats can range from hundreds of dollars to hundreds of thousands of dollars, depending on the response. School police, teachers, administrators, law enforcement all respond when violence is threatened. This past March in San Diego alone, school officials had to respond to four separate threats of school shootings. Electronically delivered threats, especially those sent via social media, have added a layer of complexity in prosecuting these cases. Current law requires that a threat be directed um, at committing a crime against a specific person, um, putting that person in sustained fear. What SB 456 does is it says that the threat can be directed at an entire school population as opposed to just one individual and doesn't require the element of sustained fear. SB 456 will provide an important tool, an important tool for law enforcement to deter future threats of gun violence. It passed with unanimous bipartisan support in the Senate and is sponsored by San Diego County District Attorney Bonnie Dumanis. The bill's robust support includes the California DA's Association, the California State Sheriff's Association, PORAC, ALADS, and many others. With me today to testify are Andreja Lopez of the San Diego County District Attorney's Office. Respectfully ask for your I vote. Okay, so this bill also has an I recommendation and two witnesses, two minutes each. Thank you. My name is Andrea Lopez. I am a deputy district attorney in the juvenile branch here to represent San Diego County District Attorney Bonnie Dumanis. Um, I have prosecuted approximately seven cases in the past six months with school shootings um, threats. Mm. And of those, five of them were made over social media directed at a school at large. Uh, this bill would allow us to effectively prosecute these types of cases and keep the law consistent between what is now written in Penal Code Section 422 as well as what's specified in Penal Code Section 148.1 .1 regarding bomb threats. As Senator Block mentioned earlier, these threats are made on social media which have afforded juveniles anonymity and they make these threats to schools at large. So this bill would allow us to not only remove the element of sustained fear, but also a specific individual. 
However, it maintains and mirrors the specific intent required currently under Penal Code Section 422. And the juvenile branch is about rehabilitating juveniles. This law would allow us to do so not only to hold them accountable, but to get them the services that are available to us that might not be available to their families or them individually. So we'd ask for your support for this bill and thank you for your time. Thank you. Next witness. Laura Tanney, um, on behalf of the San Diego County District Attorney's Office, I'd like to thank staff committee for working with us on the amendments to this bill. And otherwise, I'm in here just for technical support. Thank you. Marty Veranicar, on behalf of the California District Attorney's Association, we're in support of this measure. Thank you. Mr. Chair, members, Aaron McGuire, on behalf of the California State Sheriff's Association, in support. Uh, John Lovell, on behalf of the California College and University Police Chiefs, uh, in support, as well as the Association for Los Angeles Deputy Sheriffs, the Los Angeles Police Protective League, and the Riverside Sheriff's Association. Thank you. Khalif Asagai, on behalf of the California Public Defenders Association, we submitted an opposed letter, but we do appreciate the amendments, and with the amendments, we are moving our opposition. Micah Doctoroff, ACLU of California. Um, we also had sent in an opposed and less amended letter, and we wanted to thank the author for um, addressing many of our concerns. We have um, some remaining concerns, and we look forward to working with the author um, on those moving forward. Very good. Um, anyone then in opposition other than uh, the sort of opposition that we got in the last witness? Um, so this is, uh, we have our witnesses, Madam Vice Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just have a question. Um, you mentioned that you have prosecuted, I think you said six cases or seven cases in the, within the past year. So what was the outcome? The outcome um, so far, there has been a number of pleas. There's been a couple that have gone through um, informal motions. Um, there is one that's currently still pending, but it's very difficult um, in regards to how Penal Code Section 422 is currently written to get um, a number of the members of the bench, as well as some of the defense attorneys, to understand that there is still the threat, even though it's not made to a specific person. It's a difficult argument to make, but thus far we have reached uh, resolutions in the cases. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from the committee? Um, I'll uh, uh, just ask you then uh, to close. Uh, just sorry. request your I vote. I want to thank the author very much uh, for taking our amendments. This makes um, a threat against a school population uh, what a threat against a person would be uh, that's clearly important. I remember myself going to school and evacuating uh, when someone would call in a bomb threat. It is disruptive. It can st we have them almost every day, so it really hurt our education. So I, I think this is an important bill. Um, I think that it is totally consistent with current law. Had, uh, had the people who wrote current law thought about social media, which, of course, they, they couldn't, uh, they would have written the law this way. So I very much support this. And uh, then the motion is do pass as amended to appropriations. Do pass as amended to appropriations. Madam Secretary. We need a motion. Oh, we haven't gotten a motion yet. Moved. Second. So moved by Assemblymember Lackey, second by Assemblymember Joan Sawyer. Um, Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Quirk? Aye. Quirk, aye. Melendez? Melendez, aye. Joan Sawyer? Joan Sawyer, aye. Lackey? Lackey, aye. Lopez? Lopez, aye. Lowe? Santiago? Santiago, aye. Bill, it's out. Congratulations. And we are unanimous for our first uh, three bills. Thank you, Mr. Chair.